Lily Hardy Hammond. Have you ever heard that particular name? Are you familiar with her as an author? She lived around the turn of the 20th century. She was born in the North, but she spent most of her lifetime in the South. Her husband was a Methodist pastor, and they spent a lot of their time in the Nashville area. Mrs. Hammond spent her time as an author, raising awareness and going to bat for, even challenging the assumptions of the South regarding African Americans. And she was doing this long before the Civil Rights Movement. There's one particular novel, though, that she wrote in 1916 that has outlasted her work. So if you haven't heard the name, you will recognize what we're about to find out. She wrote a novel called In the Garden of Delight. And In the Garden of Delight is basically the chronicling of an older woman who is spending most of her time confined to a wheelchair. And so the novel is looking out at the world as she views the world and as she watches the growth of her son, her adopted son, and his fiance. And in a moment in which she feels as though they are not confiding in her like she would like them to, she says this. They have a right to their secrets and to their own lives. It's the right and natural way. I never repaid great Aunt Letitia's love to her any more than she repaid her mother's. You don't pay love back, you pay it forward. The great aunts who raised me paid their love debt, not to their mother, but to me. And I've paid what I owed them to my son and his fiance. And my son and his fiance won't pay to me. They can't. They will pay it to children yet unborn. You probably heard it. This paragraph is the earliest known mention of the phrase, pay it forward. Lily Hardy Hammond has been long gone, but that phrase lives in a 1999 movie of the same name, Pay It Forward. The idea is that kindness and favor that, are, that is shown to us is then paid forward. It's paid to the next person. Instead of repaying it back to the person who gave us the favor, we extend the favor to somebody else. And uh, theoretically, this change is keeps moving and moving forward. Now, while that phrase may be no older than 1916, <laughs> uh, the idea behind that phrase, you probably have already guessed it. It's a much, much older. It's all over the teachings of Jesus Christ. More than once, Christ said something along the lines of, uh, as you have been forgiven, forgive others. Pay it forward starts with Jesus. And of course, the favor that Jesus gives us, the grace that he gives us, can never ever be repaid because we are sinners. We can never make payment to God. We're never trying to get God to smile. We can't. It's impossible. And all of this then prompted Martin Luther to say, in one of his famous quotations, uh, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. Again, same idea. We're, there's never going to be a moment in which we can repay what we owe to Jesus, but we can extend the grace that he gives us to our neighbor. Now, as Paul is writing to a church in Rome in the early first century, Paul latches on to this idea of Jesus, that one who has known grace and has known forgiveness will now grace and forgive. Now, he's bringing it to bear on the congregation that is meeting in Rome. And this congregation, this gathering, is a multi-ethnic gathering, a gathering of Jews and Gentiles, a multi-ethnic gathering that seemingly has had a little bit of trouble along the way. And Paul writes them a letter explaining both groups enjoy the same salvation, the same grace in Jesus, they're to look at themselves as one. They are one people. They are one Israel. They are one olive tree. <laughs> and none of this is their doing. And that from the get-go, he's explaining to them that 
them coming together as a gathering, them being saved in this one salvation, they had nothing to do with it. This has all been done by Jesus. So if that's the case, if this is all of God's doing, then what's left? What's left for them to do? What is their responsibility if all of this is true? Well, and that's where we pick up in Romans chapter 12. Now, when I say Romans chapter 12, especially if I were to say Romans 12, 1 and 2, if you grew up in an evangelical home in the past 50 to 75 years, you have probably heard dozens of sermons and lessons on Romans 12, 1 and 2. In fact, the moment you hear this this morning, you're probably reaching for your phone to hit the pause button. You might come back to me and us later. <laughs> I get that. I understand that. Uh, this is the go-to verse this is the go-to verse for youth directors everywhere when they want to get the kids all fired up for Jesus. Uh, this is the verse that uh, helps bring out the self-sacrifice. You're going to spend your, your life uh, serving Jesus. Well, that's how we preached it. That's how we taught it. By the way, that thought is here. But over and over and over again, we hear from this verse that this is about surrendering your life to Jesus. You want to be sold out for Jesus? You want to know what true worship is? Well, then you simply self-sacrifice. You become a living sacrifice for Jesus. Here is what Paul says, and these are his actual words in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now, be living sacrifices. Don't be worldly. Dedicate your mind to godly thoughts so that you can obey. All this is Christian Ethics 101. <laughs> but there's something else going on here. You see, Paul hasn't stopped talking about that olive tree in chapter 11. He is still talking about the one olive tree and the one salvation that we have in Jesus. And all of us who have been grafted into this one olive tree, that conversation is still going. You see, he starts off this paragraph. Uh, again, a lot of times this goes missing. His, here's what he says. In view of the mercies of God. Well, what mercies? Well, the mercies that he just got done talking about just a few verses ago. Verse 32 of Romans 11, here's, here's what it says. We're going to start with verse 29. God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. As you once disobeyed God, but now have received mercy through their disobedience, so they too now have disobeyed. He's talking about ethnic Israel here resulting in mercy to you so that they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may have mercy on all, everyone, all people, all, peoples, all people groups, Jew and Gentile. This is all about God's mercy to all. So when we come to Romans 12:1. And he's saying, in view of God's mercies, well, what mercies? Well, these mercies, all of them, the mercies that we have in salvation, forgiveness, grace, peace, life, and rest. See, this is all about the salvation that he has given us through faith in Jesus. And he has spent his time unpacking this through the biggest part of Romans. Mercies include Jesus being bigger than sin. Jesus is bigger than the law. Jesus is bigger than death. And we are all God's children who go running to our Father, crying out, Abba, Father, who's going to rescue us? And these are all God's children who enjoy the, the blessings of what Christ has done to the point where nothing will ever separate us from God's love. And so we get here, and he is saying, in view of God's mercies. God's mercies, he's been unpacking for us throughout this whole letter that he has been writing to this church in Rome. 
And oh, by the way, that very last phrase where he says, this is all done. So uh, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That is already accomplished. That's a statement of fact. He is saying this one salvation that we have in Jesus and what Jesus has done for us has made us holy, has made us pleasing to God. God's mercy and God's grace courses through the veins of this entire passage. So if we missed what he was saying, remember he starts it off, in view of God's mercies. If we missed it, he's going to bring it up four more times. I mean, listen to this. Again, these are just phrases that have been pulled so that we can see them uh, as they are. By the grace given me, here's what we do, and here's what I'm doing. As God has distributed a measure of faith, according to the grace given to us. And then he says, according to the proportion of one's faith. Now those phrases all occur as he's unpacking for us what it looks to be, what it looks like to be this one body. But these, these, these phrase, phrases are going back to that original thought. All of this is because of God's grace. All of this is a gift that is to undeserving sinners, and God has done it anyways. Is it any more clear that all the things that we are being called to do in this passage are the result of God's grace in our lives? It's just grace, 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 and more grace here. Presenting our bodies as, li as living sacrifices is the result of what God has done for us in His grace. And we present our bodies as living sacrifices because we have been made holy and we have been made pleasing to God in His grace. It's all because of what God has done in His mercy. And this grace that we've been given is aimed not back to God. Remember how we've been talking? It's aimed at others. So listen to this. God has distributed a measure of faith, there's that grace phrase, so that we don't think more highly of ourselves than we're supposed to think. That same faith that God has given us is so that we would think sensibly. So there's that right there. All those things that are, we are doing and we are accomplishing, we're doing because of God's grace. And then he says this, according to the grace given us. Again, the salvation grace that Jesus has won for us in, his, in the cross and in his resurrection, according to that grace that has been given us, we have been given gifts. Gifts for preaching, teaching, service, giving, leading, and showing mercy. It's all there. So do you hear it? We have been given grace so that we will grace, so that we will serve others. In fact, the word mercy is here. We are given mercy. We're going to be given mercy by God. We've been grafted into the one tree by mercy. And in view of that mercy, we now show mercy to others. Pretty soon, this whole passage begins to sound like paying it forward. Because it's all about paying it forward. It's all about God's mercy that comes to me in my salvation then flowing out of me and out of us as one body to others who need mercy. You see, these gifts are not for God. These gifts are for our neighbors. It's not for ourselves. It's all about others. So, coming back to some of the phrases that are up in the first two verses, you know, we are given, we are to present our bodies as living sacrifices. We are not to be shaped by the thinking of the world. We are uh, to be instead renewed by the gospel in our minds so that we will be able to discern what the will of God is. Well, what's the will of God? Well, he just laid it out here for us to pay it forward. That's the will of God to present our bodies as living sacrifices and not being shaped by the me first thinking of the world, but instead being shaped by the gospel. That's the will of God. And it shows itself as we, as the one body, go about our preaching, teaching, giving, showing mercy, all the things that he lists here. That's the will of God for us. Again, there's a lot, a lot of thinking about the will of God out there. It's spelled out for us here. We don't have to 
be thinking all the other things that we're thinking about. It's explained to us what that is in this passage. So how is this being heard by this church in Rome? Remember, they're a multi-ethnic group, primarily Gentile, but it's a mixture of Gentiles and Jews who are all in one worship setting. And remember, Jew and Gentile, I mean, historically enemies. Different culture, different people group, different language, different ethnicities, all of this. They're all meeting together. And so Paul, as he's writing this letter to them, explaining to them how they have come to faith in Jesus and just what has transpired and what Jesus has done for them in salvation, being justified by faith through his death and then raised to new life in his resurrection. All that, everything that he's explained in this letter over and over and over again, though, he comes to this idea that they are one, that they're not Jew and Gentile, but it's Jew and Gentile together as one. He gets to chapter 9. He says, you are one offspring of Abraham. You're all God's children. You get to chapter 10. You're all of one salvation. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It is one salvation through one Jesus. And then in chapter 11, he says that they are all one olive tree and they are all one Israel. And now he gets to chapter 12. And in view of all that God has done in His mercy, He says, you are one. We've all been placed. This, what He's saying to this church in Rome is true for us here at the table. We have been placed into one body to serve each other and our neighbors. All of us have been given these gifts. If we've been placed in this body, all of us have been given these gifts, not to serve ourselves, but to serve each other. These gifts that are mentioned here, the preaching, the teaching, the serving, the giving, the showing mercy, these are just few of the gifts. Others are mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament. But all of these gifts, it's not about me. It's about you. It's about me serving you, you serving me, all of us serving each other. And then all of us together serving our neighbors and serving Los Fresnos and serving the world. All sorts of gifts. If you're in this body, you've been given a gift. We've got all these gifts, but it's just one body, all of us working together. So who would have thought of this? What kind of a God is this who does this? What kind of Jesus is going to create a new family out of all these diverse ethnicities? Well, Paul answers that question before he even started in on this in Romans 12 at the end of chapter 11, he is quoting from Isaiah 40. We're going to look at Isaiah 40. You want to know what kind of God it is who does this, who brings everybody together and makes them one, one offspring of Abraham, one salvation in Jesus, one olive tree, one Israel, one body? What kind of a God does that? This is what Isaiah says, and Isaiah is looking forward to a day that for those who are listening in Isaiah's day would have been pretty much unbelievable, totally stupendous. But this is what Isaiah says. This is what's going to happen in that day. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with a span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure or weighed the mountains on a balance? and the hills on the scales. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who gave him counsel? Who did he consult? Who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are considered as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. What kind of a God does this? That kind of a God. The God that holds everything together. The God, created, the, the God that created everything that you and I see. The one who created the oceans and the starry universe. This is the kind of a God who made the mountains. You know, this God, this God as, as great and mighty as all this looks to be, this God descended from heaven and took on flesh. 
and then he died for the sins of his people. That kind of God is the one who unites, who brings us together, who has placed us together in one family. It is that kind of God who has shown mercy, whose mercy now flows out of that body, through the body, and to others in mercy. You see, none of this is about us. None of it. Even the gifts, even the renewing of the mind, even the presenting of our bodies as a sacrifice, none of this is about us. It's always for the other guy. And Paul even says in this quote from the Old Testament, he says, who can repay God? And the answer is nobody. Nobody can repay God. It's impossible to repay God. So you know what we do? Instead of paying God back, get back because we can't, we simply shovel his mercy that he's given to us forward to the next guy. See, we come to this text like these and we hone in on something for us to do. We want something to do because we've been shaped by the world's thinking. It's all about just do it. We live in the just do it culture. But that's not what's going on here in Romans 12. It's all about paying it forward. You know, you and I have been given a lot of grace and a lot of mercy. We don't deserve any of these blessings that have come down from heaven. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve grace. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve peace or rest. We don't deserve any of this. But we've been given mercy so that others will know God's mercy. You see, he's all about building that olive tree through people. Remember, we talked about grafting in branch after branch onto this big olive tree. He's all about growing his kingdom and expanding his kingdom through people, through the one body. So becoming and being a living sacrifice is simply paying forward what God has done for us in Jesus. And that sacrifice is real. There is a monument east of London at a place called Three Mills Green. Now that monument was built decades ago. It's a picture of two hands, a sculpture of two hands, that are clasped together. Now originally stood on the site of what we're about to describe. It's been moved a little further away, but it's still there marking the area. It's the kind of service that was displayed back in 1901. 1901 at a London distillery, which is near that monument, the plant manager and some of his workers decided to check out a well that was promised to provide much needed water. One of the workers, Thomas Pickett, went down to figure out just how much water was there. He wanted to know the depth of the water, so he descends the ladder. He never came back up. Workers heard a splash. Then Godfrey Nicholson, who was the plant manager, also part owner of that distillery, he goes down to get his friend. He manages to pick up Pickett but he never makes it to the ladder. He too falls unconscious. And now the workers up top know there's something wrong. Yes, they have been overcome by lethal carbon dioxide gas. The workers at the top then scramble around, but two more workers, George Elliott and Robert Underhill, they wanted to help their friends. So they thought they could hold their breath long enough to bring their friends up they too both descended the ladder and neither came back up. All four died in the well. That monument was created to remember these men and their sacrificial sacrifice. Two hands joined together in sacrifice and in service, laying down their lives for each other. This is a little bit of what this looks like in Romans 12. You see, we are called to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and this becomes part of our worship. We, talk, we typically think about worship being on Sundays, 
This passage here is opening up worship to all sorts of other possibilities, things that we are doing together as the table for our community, for each other, hand in hand, with our hands clasped together, living sacrifices. You see, this isn't about me. This isn't about you. It's always about the other person. It's about our neighbors. There's always the temptation to make this about us instead of paying it forward. So as we think about paying it forward, we think about those two hands clasped together, moving toward our neighbors, moving toward each other, here, even here within the table, as we serve one another as living sacrifices. Now, Lily Hardy Harmon, or Hammond, knew that what would always get at paying it forward was the idea that I'm going to try and find something in it for me. She says this as, as much. What tends to go missing with her quote here about paying it forward is the rest of the paragraph. Here's what she says. Why can't I accept the pay it forward law and be glad? It's trying to grab what isn't one share that makes all the troubles in life anyway. I've always said the most secure possession was the one carried in an open hand and free to fly at a breath. You see, paying it forward means we let go. We let go what we're trying to hold on to. This is my story, graced to grace. We let go of ourselves as living sacrifices for each other and for the world. You see, we've been made one body. We've been made one body in order to let go of ourselves. Well, what kind of God would do that and put us together? Well, it's the kind of a God who let go of himself and died. For me, for you, for us.